You can see from her biography that we are in the presence of a powerful and increasingly authoritative voice in the study of photography. And it's our privilege to hear from her now. Ella, over to you. Okay, please wave at the back if I start speaking too quietly. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Simon Timms, Chris Chapman, Mark Hayworth Booth and Richard Westcott for devising this symposium, and Catherine Burrell, Mark Wallace and the whole team at Beeford for supporting this event, and also Emma Down and Deborah Phillips for their work on the archive that I'll be discussing. I also need to thank the Devonshire Association and the South West Heritage Centre for their kind assistance in my research for this. Most importantly, I'd like to thank Robin Revilius for her descriptions of the archive and for sharing her opinions on it with, with me and in her recent book, James Revilius, A Life. My talk today is about a collection of images called the Beeford Old Archive, which consists of photographic copies of photographic images of North Devon. The archive comprises 8,000 images and is available online via the Beeford website. The originals were mostly taken between 1880 and 1930, and the re-photography of them was instigated uh, by my father, by the documentary photographer James Revilius in the 1970s. Here's how this came about. Robin recalls in her book that in 1975, James was invited as a guest speaker at a local Women's Institute meeting, where, as well as giving a talk with slides of his work, he was also asked to judge their competition of the month. This competition happened to be the most interesting old photo. In doing the judging and talking to people, it struck him what a rich resource there was within people's photo collections, augmented by their own knowledge that they brought to the images. Inspired by that meeting, James bought equipment and built a copy stand to borrow and re-photograph these old photographs and began to write down the information that came with them, convincing Beeford, his employer, that building up this collection of images and information was important, that they fulfilled Beeford's brief of showing the people of North Devon to themselves. From here, James borrowed old photographs from many, old fam from many families in North Devon. Though James started the old archive and created around the first 5,000 images, photographer George Tucker made a significant contribution to the old archive too, adding at least another 3,000 images. And I also wish to credit former Beeford archivists Bryony Harris, Liz Tainton and Beryl Yates for their work on it. Robin recalls that when, a, when James got a good crop of images from a particular village, he would make them into slides and go back and give a slideshow as a way of saying thank you. She says, I went to one in Dalton that resulted from finding all these lovely pictures in the parish. The village hall was packed and as soon as the images appeared, there was a great roar from the audience which never stopped throughout. They were thrilled and could, were contributing information and would come up afterwards with more. He would ask for help from the audience on a photograph he couldn't place. The information and photographs the audience provided illustrated the network of relationships across the area. Conversations at these meetings led him to new things to photograph, so they helped shape the new archive as well as the old. Slideshows represent a performative, communal, participatory and time-based way of experiencing photography, well away from the normal exhibition space. And in my mind, there's a clear lineage here from photographic lantern slide performances during the late 19th and early 20th century, which were a major source of visual information about the world for normal people. And I see what James was doing with his 35mm slideshows right through to PowerPoint presentations today as continuations of that type of photographic performance. Local exhibitions of the archive were also arranged, such as this one in King's Nympton, again very attuned to and in collaboration with their audience. And I think it's fair to say that this kind of activity is very remote from the concerns and practices of the wider photography scene during this era. Here's what the actual archive looks like. Books of 35mm negative strips and contact sheets. Because the historic photographs were only borrowed, they themselves are not part of the archive, in the sense there are no photographic originals, just James and George's copies of them, made using a camera on a copy stand. 
And this was all done in the pre-digital era. So that's why I say these photographs were re-photographed, not digitised. Not being originals, sits these images outside the normal canon of photographic values of age and materiality. Though, of course, the 35mm negatives are themselves material photographic objects with their own qualities. But this is an archive of copies. So you might think, why is it important? But two things make this archive significant. One being that the original photographs copied from it for the archive were never gathered together and made searchable in the way that the old archive is. Many of the originals may now be lost, destroyed or faded, or if they do survive, data which accompanied them may be lost. The other thing that gives the archive value is, as with James's own photographs, the precise accompanying data. James and archive staff recorded names, places and stories from the lenders of the photographs and added them to a card index, which makes the images relevant as social history documents. To give you an example of how this changes the photographs in the archive, this rather faded, unexceptional photograph shows an elderly lady in a shop, but it has the following information. Mrs. Callard, in her shop in Ashraini, grocers and home bakers. She was a great benefactress to the village. She had her leg amputated on the shop counter by Dr. Locke. Mr. Bird confirmed that her leg was buried in the garden to JHR. <laughs> I hope you'll agree that this adds a rich layer of social history information to the photograph. <laughs> Similarly, through the text and images together, you can track whole family dynasties in the area, practices, customs, and continuity and change between the old archive and the new. But this specific naming of people and places, both in the old archive and in James's work, is an absolutely central issue for me. These same Im images, divorced from their information, might well be floating around on the internet as part of the global visual economy, as nostalgic representations of Devon or of farming, and as such might prop up stereotypes of both. But the naming reclaims these images as personal and specific in a way that fundamentally undermines such stereotypes. Once you've read the captions, these people only represent themselves. Aside from containing copies, another thing complicating the perceived value of the archive is that some of the copied images were in fact photographic postcards. As photographic historian Elizabeth Edwards notes, picture postcards are seldom considered as significant players in the photographic culture. And photographically, they are seen as mass-produced, transitory, low quality and commonplace, and as divorced from the photographic cultures, practices and debates that produced them. But these photographic postcards play a key role in the archive. Made by local photographers, they show us how the county desired to be perceived to tourists and what was thought notable or picturesque. More prosaically, information stamped at the bottom or scratched into the negative give us extra information about the photographer, the place, event and date. And to consider these images in context, I want to very briefly look more widely at the history of the photographic trade in Devon. Many historians have worked on this, so I'll not be attempting a comprehensive survey. I shall leave that to others, and here I'd like to thank Peter Christie, James Ryan, Tom Greaves, Sadru Banji, and Simon Timms for their books, articles, and research. But to give an overview, in 1843, William Henry Fox Talbot made a salted paper print from a calotype negative depicting a couple studying the geology in Chudley. This is possibly the first verifiable photographic image taken in Devon. And from here, we have different sectors getting involved. We have Devon-born photographers working elsewhere, such as Richard Beard and Linnaeus Tripe, national photographers who visited Devon to photograph, who included incredible photographers, Hugh Owen, Francis Bedford, Roger Fenton, William Sherlock, Frank Mason Good, Benjamin Brecknell Turner, and Frederick Scott Archer. And then finally, you have the major view photography firms of Frith & Co. and George Washington Wilson, also including views of Devon in their stock. The increase in tourism to Devon, thanks to the coming of the railways and the increased market for scenic photography and portrait photographers, gradually meant that photography began to be viable as a local trade. Regional commercial photographers were based at first in the main towns and created carte de visite, so little portraits, uh, as their business, 
So we have companies like Vickery and Barnstable and Owen Angel in Exeter, to name a few. And I couldn't resist including this one, uh, as the camera that you see here is in Ram's collections, uh, belonging to Owen Angel. Particularly notable was William Spreet uh, in Exeter, a photographer who Greaves rightly describes as one of the earliest and most important commercial photographic recorders of the county of Devon. As advances in photography progressed, some of these photographers began to offer other photographic media, such as cabinet cards, stereographs, and lantern slides. But this Victorian era activity sets the scene for the mainly Edwardian local photographers who are represented in the old archive. More affordable and portable equipment and processes, such as dry plates, allowed photographers to move out of the studio setting and expand their repertoire. By 1900, the trade in photographic postcards was commercially viable, with Kodak making portable folding cameras which printed postcard size images. And the trade was taken up in some, to me, surprisingly small towns in Devon. A photographer, Albert Edward Berg, that's him, uh, was based in Hatherley and often included his own shop in his views, shown here. As you can see from his sign, photography was by no means his sole profession. But instead, as so often with commercial photographers at this time, it was a side business, coupled with running a post office and a pharmacy. For photographic practice involved a supply of chemicals, lenses, glass and scientific knowledge, and was therefore a good sympathetic side trade for many local chemists and opticians. It was also a good trade for stationers and post offices, as they could retail their own photographs as postcards. Berg's business was later taken over by his assistant, Henry Watts, and you can see here the same shop with the new name above the door. James also recorded that Joe Elliott in Merton took many of the archive photographs, and there were others too, Dyer and Andrews in Torrington, for example, and it's really clear that James liked finding information about these earlier photographers. But what I want to consider now is how the old archive might have influenced James's own photography. <coughs> Robin has written about James's sources of inspiration, including painters such as Mondrian and Bruegel, and the printmaker Samuel Palmer, and the photographers Edwin Smith, Ansel Adams, and Cartier-Bresson. But James was also influenced by the old archive and responded to the themes of commercial rural photographers to some extent. And this mixing of the visual language of rural photography was from, with his influences from within the canon of documentary photography and from the world of painting and fine art is I think what makes his work unique. I certainly can't think of another photographer with quite this eccentric range of inputs. James was known for using pre-war uncoated lenses with his Leica camera, but also he experimented with older photo photographic equipment, similar to what photographers such as Dyer, Berg and Watts might have used. Uh, you can see here the plate camera he built himself, that he used for, among other things, view towards Iddesley, one of his best images. And as you've seen already today, uh, Chris Chapman captured him in action with this camera in one of my favourite photographs of my dad. Now these days, there's a burgeoning scene of contemporary photographers revisiting earlier processes. But back when James did this, it really wasn't common practice at all. Due to the timing of the photographs in the old archive and James's own work, at times the same paper was sharp in each. To give a few examples, here is Reuben Clements of Dalton, as a young man in the old archive, and as an elderly gentleman photographed by James. And here's Nora Maynard, as a young girl and an elderly lady. You might notice the young man with wild hair and no hat at the back of this bus outing. This chap here which is this man, <laughs> Archie Parkhouse, <laughs> who James photographed many times. As well as people, the same places crop up. Occasionally James would deliberately retake the same shot as an old archive photo, but mostly it's more subtle. For example, this Dalton double wedding is taken in just the same spot as this photograph by James of the Mother's Parade 70 odd years later or this image by Frith & Co of Westwood Ho, echoed by James uh, in this image, uh, taken in 1975. 
Also customs, such as Hatherley Silver Band playing at Iddersley Club Day, shown here in 1911, uh, and here in 1975. And this shows the continuity of rural life. And the same events were often recorded, such as Dalton Carnival, uh, here in around 1910, and captured here by James in 1981. I even found such ephemeral events as uh, the flower show at St Giles in the Wood, with the entries shown here in 1914, and taken here by James 60 years later. So these examples show the value of the archive as a social history resource. What I've also been thinking about, however, is the value of the old archive to photographic histories, despite it being an archive of copy photographs. One feature of re-photography is that one can obtain details from images, which James liked to explore and print up larger as standalone images. He was clearly taken by the women in this image. Similarly, um, this image here of Robra Choir, uh, I think he was particularly uh, fond of the little girl in the corner having a fit of the giggles. <laughs> Uh, and these details really appeal to me too. They make the people suddenly look startlingly, startlingly contemporary and real. They bring to the fore what Elizabeth Edwards describes as the way photographs, the way photography projects the past into the present, and the way photographs hold the presence of historical actors, not merely as physical traces, but in holding their very presence, their social being, and the experiences they lived through, that it happened to them. James absorbed a kind of lexicon of local photography through working on the old archive, building up an image bank of landscapes, subjects, and views in his mind from the older photographs. This gave him insights that photographing this event or that practice was part of a tradition of photography in the area. This lexicon of rural English <coughs> commercial photography includes not only portraiture, but wedding photography, trade photography, photojournalism of a local sort, school groups, sporting teams, bell ringers, so many bell ringers, <laughs> livestock photography, and landscape, landscape views. James's own notes in the archive catalogue make specific ref references between the old archive and his own work. Uh, Robin states that working on the old archive reinforced his feeling that what he was doing would become valuable. He saw the future value of his own work, which reaffirmed his own practice. Now, the following slides are all pairings of old archive photographs with James's own work, which I chose as a way of thinking about the interrelations of the archives and to think about motifs and preoccupations which cross between both, even if the exact place or people are not directly linked. Now, I'm just going to move through these. I'm not going to speak to each one, but I just wanted to give you a flavour of what I was finding. But what meaning might this archive hold today? To give one example, Robert Darch, who's here today, 
A contemporary photographer who's working in Devon, who has recently undertaken commissions for Beeford, has a long family connection to the area. His relatives were bakers who owned mills at Lankey, Dalton and North Taunton, and one of them, John Dart, shown here, was also a keen photographer. Several photographs taken by John, or depicting him and his family, exist in the old archive. So you see, even over a century later, we find legacies in the archive, not just to present-day people, but to present-day photographers. Aside from being a neat ending, this exemplifies how the naming and specificity of the archive gives it continued meaning beyond just being a bunch of images. Many of our conversations at the Beeford Archive Steering Group have dealt with how to contextualise James's work as simultaneously a social history document and an artistic practice. And the discussions had by that group have helped shape my thinking on how we define those terms and how the boundaries between them have shifted over time. So in this talk, I've hopefully given you a sense of my father's interests in earlier photographers of Devon and their practice, and proposed how working on the old archive might have been an influence on his own work. I hope I've also shown the value of the old archive to both social and photographic histories. Thank you.